All right, okay, we are in the second part today of It's Time. Last week, we started off by saying it's time to rest. If you did not catch last week's sermon, you can go on, you can go online on SoundCloud or you can go on the Lifehouse Church app and you can catch last, uh, last week's sermon called It's Time to Rest. Today, though, our topic is it's time to live. It's time to live. And some of you are like, John, we're kind of living right now. What do you mean it's time to live? But honestly, I think it's true that you can be alive, but not truly live. And really, it almost seems like we have a culture that just knows this, where we have almost said, okay, we can be breathing, but not living. We can be physically alive, but not actually live. And so we have a culture that has developed language to actually show this. And it's, you know, it's, we even say YOLO. You only live once. Like, you live once, you got to live it up, man. Like, you, you got to, like, go everywhere you can and get every experience you can. You got to travel and visit and explore and just fit as much of life as you can into one life. We, 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 we've also created something called FOMO, fear of missing out. It's like you scroll online. It's like, man, I got to go there. I got to do that. And it's just like we don't want to miss out on anything that life has to offer. And then we've got songs like Live Like You Were Dying, right? Like let's, I'm not going to sing it. I sang it in first service and then second service I thought better of it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, you know, like, like, like live as if at any moment you could die. Like just live as much as you possibly can because we're scared to almost mislive. There, there, uh, check out this, this quote here, William Irvine. He said this. He said, there is a, a danger that you will mislive that despite all of your activity, despite all the pleasant diversions you might have enjoyed while alive, you will end up living a bad life. There is, in other words, a danger that when you are on your deathbed, you will look back and realize that you wasted your one chance at living. Instead of spending your life pursuing something genuinely valuable, you squandered it because you allowed yourself to be distracted by the various babbles that life has to offer. It's almost like we've got a fear that we're going to miss out on life. But here's the thing. My question is this. Is are we fearful of the wrong thing about life? That honestly, yes, you can be alive but not live. But at the same time, Jesus came and Jesus actually said this and if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this, know this. It's John 10.10. 10. He said that I have come to give you life and life what? Abundantly. He said, I have come to actually give you life and give you life abundantly. And Jesus actually had this same message. Jesus came to people that were living, and Jesus told, told them, you can actually be alive but actually not be living. This was one of Jesus' core messages. Like, Jesus would come and say this to people that were physically living, and what he would tell them is things like this. He would, he would say, though you're seeing, you're actually blind. Though you're hearing, you're actually deaf. Though you're seeing, you're actually, you're, you're, you're actually not seeing. And, and really what I think we see in our culture is that we have the wrong fear. Our culture fears not getting the most out of life, like different, you know, different experiences, a different job, you know, different family moments and all of these things. But Jesus' biggest fear for your life isn't that you would miss out on experiences. It's not that you would miss out on the perfect job. It's not that you would miss out on the perfect spouse. Jesus' fear for your life is that you would be physically alive but spiritually dead. Jesus, he was actually in, in John chapter 3. Jesus here, he, 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 he started to have a conversation with this, with this Pharisee, a religious leader back in Jesus' day named Nicodemus. And we're going to actually pick up on the conversation here. In John chapter 3, it says this, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee, 
After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. He said, Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your signs are evidence that God is with you. So here's the thing, right? This Pharisee comes up and he tries to make, to make spiritual talk. It's kind of like, what's up, Jesus, man? We can see, yo, you a baller, bro. We do miracles. We can tell you preach and teach like Stephen Furtick. Like, you are amazing, Jesus. And, and you know, he's trying to, like, make spiritual talk. And Jesus cuts right through the bull crap. Jesus cuts. And this is why I love Jesus. Because Jesus cut right through what he was trying to, like, hey, Jesus, what's up, man? You a good spiritual leader. You a good spiritual teacher. Man, you so awesome, man. Rah, rah, rah. He says, hey, Nicodemus, let me tell you something. He said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He says, well, what do you mean? He exclaimed Nicodemus, probably like flabbergasted because he was a religious leader. Who are you to tell me? He says, how, and then, then he's like, well, Jesus, how can a man who is, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born naturally, but, and of the spirit. He says, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. And what Jesus was saying here is you can be, spir- you can be physically alive, but spiritually dead. And Jesus' biggest, biggest fear for this Pharisee, he said, you can be physically alive and doing good spiritual things, but still be dead in your spirit. And that is Jesus' fear for you, that you would actually be a physical, breathing human being, but your spirit be dead. And Paul, in Ephesians, actually builds on this same concept. He says here, Ephesians 2, and and he's, he's talking here to a church he planted in the city of Ephesus, and he's writing back to them to explain more about the gospel. He says it's once you were dead because of your disobedience and your sins. And what Paul is, ex- is explaining here, what, what Jesus said, is that sin is what ultimately brings death. We studied this in the previous series we did. Sin is what ultimately brings death. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. And sin is simply a churchy word that simply means this, you choosing what you want instead of what God's best is. And we all have a proclivity and inclination inside of us to choose the exact opposite of what God wants. We're, scripture says we're born with this, that we have this, this desire inside of us to do the exact opposite. And I say this almost like I've got three reasons why I believe this is true. And their names are Jackson, Judah, and Dallas. Those are my three sons. I don't teach them to not obey me. They just don't do it. They just... Mine, me, myself, I did not, that that was a proclivity inside of them. And what Jesus and what Paul is saying here, because of this sinful nature inside of us, that actually brings a spiritual death to us. But here's the thing, that is all of us. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So there's no human being ever lived besides Jesus who has not sinned. But it's because of that sin that we have a spiritual death. We can be physically Alive, but spiritually dead. Jesus, or uh, Paul, he says, once you were dead, everyone say dead, because of your disobedience and your sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations, here's the thing, of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else but then it says but God everyone say but God that's a big but it says but God is so rich in mercy he loved us so much that even though we were dead everyone say dead dead because of our sins he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead it is only by God's grace that you have been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Everyone say gift. 
gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Here's, a, here's, here's the thing, y'all. The truth is, is that Jesus did not come to just simply take bad people and make them good. Jesus came to take dead people and make them alive. Jesus came to take people who were spiritually dead and spiritually apart from from God and take them and make them alive. And this is the life that Jesus wants for you. Whenever Jesus said, I came to give you life, he came to breathe life into your soul and into your spirit, not just to give you a physical life. But the thing is, though, like, we just think God just came to, you know, just take some bad people and make them some good people. People that wouldn't normally walk an old lady across the street, now we'll walk an old lady across the street. Those that, you know, we see a homeless person on the side, oh, bad people, they wouldn't give them any money. But now good people, God just wants to make people that will give people. No, no, that, that was not the point. He came to take people that were dead because of their sin. Jesus came and lived the life you could not live, a perfect sinless life, and died the death that you should have died in your place and for your sin. But, but because Jesus never, ever sinned, death and sin could not hold him down. So what did, did Jesus do? We're going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday coming up here soon. Jesus rose and defeated Satan, sin, and death. And because Jesus won life, he can freely give life to those who put their faith and trust in him. Because he is the author of life, and Jesus can give life. Here, here's the thing. You were dead, but those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, they now have what Jesus calls real life, eternal life. What Paul says is that they've gone from death to life. And so there, here's the thing. There's a switch that has come on for those who have gone from death to life. And this is the good news, guys. And this is what, as the church, we can't forget this. Because we're prone to just be like, yeah, the gospel, that's great. Let's move on to something spiritual. Let's move on to something more intriguing. Let's move on to something more, more mentally stimulating. No, this is the foundation for all we do. You should be, thank- you should be thanking God every day for the fact that he's taken you from death to life because of what Jesus did. I'm serious, y'all. We can't forget this. And, and, uh, and the thing is, this is the great equalizer. That at the cross of Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, young, poor, rich, old, whatever. At the cross, we are all at the same place of need. And that is why throughout church history, you see that it, it it is just littered with just all forms and different shapes of people following Jesus. Why? Because it's the great equalizer. That we've all sinned and we're all in need of grace. We're all in need to be taken from death to life. But here's the thing, right? We, th- there is somebody in, in, in our popular culture that has experienced this, that you would probably know if I said his name. And I'm going to say it's, it's Kanye West. Okay? Well, let's just be honest. Kanye was a psychopath. <laughs> I mean, he was a little out, he was a little out there, man. Like, literally, man, he was that dude, you know, go and, go and just break up award shows and, you know, Beyonce. <laughs> like, it was great. You know, it was just like, but he just, and then his songs were just about what this stuff was about. But we can see a year ago, they're, he, he ain't the same person. And now he's seeing things differently. He's treating people differently. His life has a brand new purpose, meaning out, outlook on it. He has encountered death. But now he has encountered life. And, and, and that's what I want to challenge us with is, is this like, are, has there been a death to life experience for you? I mean, have you seen people that have danced at the doorstep of death but had another opportunity to live? How there is this renewed sense of like, I've got to make the most of life. And I believe if anybody should embody this mentality, it is those who have gone from death to life in Christ. That we have people who are deeply aware of what their sin, what the cost of sin was. It was eternity from God, but also know the depths of the grace and love that they have been given. And that they live in light of and they live because of 
the depths of that grace and love that God has given them. And it is literally like you have now, you are alert and awake and your eyes are open to all God wants to do in you and all God wants to do through you. I pray that we would all have an experience the same way that Kanye, I can't believe I'm saying that, but, but like have an experience like Kanye was where we would see our eyes are open to all God wants to do. But, but here's the thing, what I've seen in the church is we have people that are alive. They, they get the whole death to life thing. They get the whole Jesus thing, right? They, they get the whole I was once in and now I'm sin because of what Jesus did for me. Yeah. But what I've seen is that the church can be alive, yet we can have a tendency to be asleep. You see a tendency of Christians and churches believe the gospel, love Jesus, they're saved. They have, you know, they, they get the whole cross, resurrection, they, they get that. But what they have a tendency to do, our human proclivity is then, is to fall asleep. And though we're living, we're sleeping. What you see, and, and it was crazy studying this in scripture, to see how this can be a proclivity of people of God. You can see Old Testament, Israel. We, you can see God using the prophets to come and tell his people, wake up. Wake up. You, you can see Paul, check it out, First Thessalonians 5. He says this, so be on your guard, not asleep. It's like, like, like stay alert, wake up. Be clear-headed. He's talking to the church here. He's, he's like, look, you are in a crazy time right now. Like, you got to wake up. Wake up. Right, Romans 13. This is Paul talking to the church in Rome. He says, this is all the more urgent for you. Know how late it is. The time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Even in the book of Re Revelation, the first couple chapters there, it is centered on Jesus speaking to specific churches, and one of these specific churches that Jesus was talking to, he says this here, he says, I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead, wake up, wake up, think about it this way, even Jesus' disciples, Matthew 26, 36 through 46, let's go ahead and read this to you, it says, then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, hold on, let me set the context here. This is right before Jesus was about to embark on the worst week of his life, Passion Week, leading up to the cross. This is, this is a, a week that Jesus was going to be brutally beaten. He was going to go through, through physical trauma, emotional trauma, and he was just going to go through one of the worst weeks of his life. And he wanted to get alone by himself and pray and ask some of his disciples to come and pray with him so so. This was a pivotal moment in Jesus' life. He says, then Jesus went with them, he's talking about his disciples, to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, he said, couldn't you watch me even? He's like, come on, Peter. Come on, bruh. One hour. Keep watching, pray, so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to his disciples and said, go ahead and get your nap. <laughs> Just go ahead and get it. 
says, but look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Y'all, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is, is that the church, we have a proclivity individually and corporately. Though we can be alive and know the gospel, know that we pass from death to life, we can sleep on the calling and purpose that God has for us. And what my challenge is, is over the next 15 minutes with this sermon is, is, is to encourage you, to encourage us individually and corporately to wake up. Everyone say, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Because honestly, just in the same way, the disciples who saw Jesus do miracles, who saw Jesus raise the dead, who saw Jesus feed the 5,000, who saw Jesus do miraculous things in the moment of one of his greatest times of needing them, they could not keep their eyes open. And I couldn't shake the fact of that's the way I feel so many churches individually and corporately are in this critical moment in our city's history and the church history. Is that we are people that are having a hard time keeping our eyes open because we are being lured and lulled to sleep and missing out on the potential that God wants to use us to. And, and like I said, this is corporately not just as the big C church, but also us individually. And, and that's why I, I think, right, church, church is so important, right? It's, it's so funny in this day and age how almost the church is being like, yeah, I love Jesus, but not the church. What? I, I get the fact that there are many people that, that have been hurt by the church. And the church has done some stupid things and said some stupid things. Like, I'll be the first to say, because I've been a part of some churches that have said and done some stupid stuff. And our church has done and said some stupid stuff, right? But honestly, you've got to stop equating people to the church. Even though the church is people, yes, here's, here's the thing. The church is Jesus' bride. He died for the church. He, he loves the church. Like the church is what he's died for. And God has put the church, has established the church for the purpose of being his physical representation on this planet while he is not here. That as we all come, come together and be the body of Christ, we actually corporately go and show, show the whole world who God is and what God is like through the church coming together to be the body of of Christ. And let me tell you this, I think one of the church's biggest, biggest purposes, like why Jesus said, you know what, I'm going to create a body of people that are all different, weird, got their own idiosyncrasies and got their own, I mean, just we're going to put them all together. So here's the thing, they can come together to help each other wake up. Because I think Jesus knew if people are left to themselves, they will float, they will wonder they 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 will divert on their own path and jesus said i need to create a system a structure so people can help each other say hey wake up hebrews 10 check check this out it says this let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works and it says let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do so obviously, even back in that time period, people were like, yeah, I love Jesus, but, but not the church. I don't need to, I mean, you know, I don't need. No, he's saying, look, we need to think of ways to motivate each, each other, and we don't need to stop getting together corporately. And it says, but then encourage one another, wake up one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What this is saying here is it's like, yo, we need to get together corporately so we can encourage. And one translation actually says spur spur one uh, an, another on. I didn't know what spur was until it was like the San Antonio Spurs. Oh, like a, like a spur. Okay, it was like, okay, spur, you know, spurs, what do spurs do? They help wake up the horse. Like, whoa, come on, let's go. And that's what the church is called to do, is to help each other wake up. Here's the thing, I'm gonna give you three things quickly in closing. But honestly, I, I think individually and corporately, we need to help each other wake up out of because we are prone to fall into these three things. First off, wake up out of your comfort zone. When was the last time you did something that was outside of your comfort zone and faith zone in regards to your walk with the Lord? Because y'all, let's just, let's just be candid. We are people and creatures of, com of comfort. And I know this because y'all sit in the same seats. And I'm the, I'm the right, you know, I had somebody after, uh, um, I had somebody after first service come up to me. They were like, 
want, just want to let you know I sit I sit up here because I'm distracted. And blah, blah. I'm like, dude, you don't have to explain. I'm just kidding. I'm like, I do the same thing. It's like I walk in like a daggone robot, and I just like, and I go to the place where I typically always sit, right? But here's, here's the thing. It's a small sample size that we are prone to keep going the same way and doing the same things, and we are not prone to getting out of our comfort zone. We just aren't. It's, it's not because we're bad people. It's because we're humans. Right? But honestly, this, this small example can become a lot of the way we do things in regards to our faith. Where we won't do anything outside of what feels comfortable, normal, and natural to us. And honestly, I believe that we need each other to kind of say, hey, get out of your comfort zone. Like, when are you going to do something that honestly, you step out and do it, and it's like, if God doesn't show up, it's not going to work. When was the last time you did something for God and your heart was shaken so hard you could barely even contain it? To where it was like you were stepping out on faith. And honestly, I believe we need each other to be spurring each other on to get out of our comfort zones. Because honestly, what we see is very rarely does God work outside or, excuse me, very rarely does God work always inside of your comfort zone. And we know this to be true in anything, vocationally, physically. It's like you grow when you're outside of your comfort zone. You grow when you do something beyond what you've normally and always done. So here's the thing, right? I think the church is together to say, hey, wake up. you got to do something outside of your comfort zone. And here's, here's the craziest thing. Book of Acts, right? This was the, the book of the Bible describing and giving the history of the early church. And the church started and boomed in the city of Jerusalem, but the gospel was not meant just to stay in one city. It was supposed to be spread to the whole world. But, but, but the thing is, the early church, they only kept it in Jerusalem, probably because it was comfortable and they kind of knew hey the people in Jerusalem they have a concept about God so we're just going to stay with these people that have a concept about God and kind of take Jesus and kind of just like add them on well then you see Acts 8 we can we can see this here it says on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria you ever like John what what does this have to do with anything it took persecution to scatter the church it took getting getting it took getting the disciples outside of their comfort zone to leave their comfort zone in jerusalem to take the message of the gospel to where it was originally intended to go that's how i know we are the same and then honestly, I pray that God does not put us in a position where, where he's got to persecute us or do something else to us to get us scattered. We say, God, scatter us, take us, get us out of our comfort zone so we can see the kingdom of God move forward. But honestly, we need the church to kind of say, hey, wake up. Here's the, here's the thing. If you've been coming to this church and you're comfortable sitting in a, in a seat every Sunday, we thank God for that. We want to say continually do that. But at the same time, if you are comfortable, maybe it's time to take a step out of your comfort zone and maybe join a team. Maybe you're like, John, I don't like people. That's why I sit in a seat. And so I don't have to communicate with other human beings. Because I like to come in, get my word, get my worship in, and holla. I'm, I'm out, and I'm comfortable. And that's fine. But at the same time, what if God was calling you beyond your comfort zone? So maybe he wants to grow your love for people. So maybe to grow your love. See, here's the thing. You can say, God, grow me, grow me. God, Lord, Lord, you know, uh, God, grow me, God, Lord, Lord. I want to grow. I want to mature. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, then you have to do something outside of what your normal is. And that's about to say, maybe the next step for you is to join a team. One, one of the examples, every time I use Bill Nicer, he, he was in first service. Billy, Billy Bob Nicer is what, is, is what I call him. Whenever he first started coming to our church, he, he came up to me. He said, hey, John, I'm a bean counter. I was like, I don't even know what that means. It's like a bean counter, like you for real count beans? No, but, but he was just like, look, he was just like, look, I'm going to give some money 
and I'm going to take up a seat. And that, that is what I'm called to do. I'm like, okay, cool, cool, bro. You come, you come, do you? Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, uh, I think it was 2018, or I think it was 2000, I don't remember what it, what it was, what year are, are we in? 2018. Um, it, w- it was a day where we didn't have two services, we only had one service. So instead of having a 9 and 10.30 service, we only had a 10 o'clock service. And, but Bill didn't know that. And so Bill shows up for the 9 o'clock service at 9.20. A little bit later, but he showed up 40 40 minutes early for the set for, for, for the you know the, the only service that we had going on that day, and we said, "Hey, Bill, welcome to our dream team. <laughs> you're here, you're here early. We've got a spot at the door open, and Bill's a good Christian guy, so he's like, yeah, yeah, great, awesome, awesome, okay, you know, goes over the, over there, and you know, Bill he serves, and then he comes back to us afterwards. He said, I love that. He said that was." much fun and literally ever since that day bill like you have to tell him not to be on the dream team he's like bill go go home like bill we got people like bill we don't we don't we don't need but 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 at the same time he stepped out of his comfort zone and stepped into something that he never even something that he loved that he didn't even know and i believe there's so many people in our church right now you are in that exact same spot you're comfortable and we love the fact that that you're finding comfort here we love the fact that that man that man you love services you love us but at the same time there could be a different level for you as you step outside of your comfort zone and do something you've never done if you're comfortable in your you know if you're comfortable in your finances we love that but at the same time maybe god is calling you to give something that makes you a little uncomfortable when when was the last time you did something outside of your comfort zone secondly not just Wake up out of your comfort zone, but secondly, wake up out of, wake up out of your sin. Wake up out of your sin. It's it's really crazy how we can be so easily lulled into sin being being normal, where it's this stuff we know isn't good, and we just like. We just, fall as- we just fall asleep. And it's just stuff that we know isn't good, stuff we know we shouldn't be doing, people we know we shouldn't be with, and it's just... Just think, we've all done it. But honestly, that's why the church is here, where we need to, like, go to each other and be like, hey, dude, what, what are you doing? Like, why, like dude, what, what in the world? Wake up. Not in a, like, mean way, not in a jerk way, but it's a, there's God's got better for you. God's got a better plan. Do things God's way. Don't do things your way. Do things God's way. There's a reason he's got it like that. Here's the thing. I just think sin, we can almost be, you know, kind of just develop sin. is so archaic. It's so old school. It's so holy roller. But at the same time, sin is simply, like I said, us choosing what we want over what God's best is. And here's the thing. Sin, it, sin doesn't just break God's law. Sin breaks God's heart. And I think sometimes we can say sin is, oh, we broke Section 4, Addendum 3. No, no, sin, sin I mean, just to, if, if you are parents here, you know how it breaks your heart when your child does something outside of what you know is best. It breaks your heart. You're not just like, you broke my law. You're like, you're, like, you're breaking my heart because I know what's best for you. I know what's best for you. When was the last time your sin actually grieved you? Like, actually, like, you know, when was the, the last time you prayed, God, if there's anything inside of me that, that you want, you got it. If there's any way inside of me that is not pleasing to you, show it to me. And it's yours. I think we spend way too much time justifying sin instead of repenting of it. And I just really sincerely believe that there are some of you here, you need to hear this today. Wake up from, from, from your sin and turn from it. It's not something you don't know, but you need to act on what you do know. Wake up. It's, it's Jesus telling you today, wake up. 
do things my way. Third, thirdly, this is going to sound whatever, but it's not intended to wake up out of, wake up out of your selfishness. Because y'all, let me just tell you, the natural flow of life, our culture is everything is geared and centered around you, right? You, 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 me, myself, and I. And it's so easy if we're not careful for the church just to become something else that exists for us to consume. Where we just consume, consume, consume instead of saying God hasn't put you here just to be a consumer. He's put you here to be a contributor. That you are a part of God's church for the, for the very purpose. We don't care where you're at on your faith journey. We don't care if you've just started serving Jesus. We don't, we don't care where you're at. If you call Lifehouse home, there's a spot and place for you to make a difference to make a difference. Here's the, here's the thing, y'all. The church is the place that we have to consistently shake each other and say, wake up. This church isn't about us. God has put us here to be his hands and his feet in this world. Our first core value at our church is, is, is this here, mission over preference. Mission over preference. What, what does that mean, John? Mission over, over preference simply means this. The mission of the church will always go before our personal preference of what we want the church to be. Let me break that down for you, right? We all have preferences of what we want church to be. But at the same time, we're going to go to the Bible, Scripture, and we're going to say, what is God's vision for the, for the church? And, and really, the truth is all of us have to in some ways put our preference down of what we want the church to be to say, God, we want the church to be what what." you want it to be, and your church is called to be the mission and plan and purpose, hands and feet of God in this planet. So honestly, in, in some way, shape, or form, we, we all have to shake each other and say, wake up, this church isn't about us. We've got to wake up out of, wake up out of our selflessness and not just be consumers, but we've got to say, God, how do you want to use me to be a contributor to what you want to do in and through this church in, in, in this city? I believe, guys, the call to us today is we can be physically alive but spiritually dead we can be physically alive and spiritually alive but spiritually sleeping and the call to us today is to wake up so we can live and be god's hands and god's feet it is time to live church it is too important of a time period in the church's history, our city's history. And we've been given a Kairos moment in, in time to say we are called to be the hands and feet in, in this city. Would you stand up with me, church? We're going to pray.